okay, I guess I'm doing this video while Sunny sits here and begs for pets because he's refusing to leave. Obviously, I'm wearing my regular muggle clothes today rather than a costume to get the video started. And the reason for that is today I'm going to be doing a closet tour, so I'll be trying on a lot of different costumes. So I didn't really feel like there was a need. Um, I didn't think that there was a need to actually start out the video in a costume. Hopefully I'm not the only one who absolutely loves closet tours. I think it's really amazing, especially when someone has a lot of vintage clothes or a lot of historical costumes to actually see what's in their closet and to see what they actually own. They're kind of a guilty pleasure of mine. So if you like seeing a display of horrifying materialism that borders on hoarding, then stick with me and I will show you everything that I have in my closet. Starting with this yellow striped Robala Anglaise, which was my first 18th century project. Although I've been sewing for a long time, believe it or not, I've actually only been doing historical costuming for around two years now. I decided that I needed a little bit of a challenge, which is how I got into historical costuming in the first place. This dress could probably use an update with some new trim or some ruffles or something to make it feel a little more fresh. But the reason I haven't gotten around to that is because I put it on and realized that there's a big tear on one side. To be honest, I don't even remember how that happened. When I made this dress originally, I had planned on wearing it a la polonaise, but I think it looks really good both ways. I think the reason that I actually chose to do an a la polonaise as my first project was because it seemed easier than trying to figure out how to even the hem over a bum roll. I really learned a lot from this first project. Up next is a rust color robe a la anglaise that's actually made with the same pattern as the last one. In the 18th century, there really just weren't that many different styles of gowns, so I found myself returning to the same patterns again and again. Although this dress also has the option to be worn a la polonaise, I have it down in this video. If you look closely, you can see that the petticoat originally came out a little too short. Fortunately, piecing is period, so I just added a little bit of fabric back to the bottom again. Before I wear this gown again, I'll also need to repair the hook and eyes at the center front. Up next we have an unfinished project that's actually based on a famous painting called The Chocolate Girl. I'm not really sure why, but I abandoned this project when it was 95% done. There's only a few things left to finish on it, including tacking the cuffs down and making a cap so that I'll match the painting. I think I gave up on this project because it felt really plain and not at all glamorous, which was missing a lot of the point of historical costuming for me. I think now's a good time to fast forward to about a year later when I did my first sack or robe a la Francaise gown. This gown was inspired by the Dior 1948 fall and winter collection, which had both a lot of petal shapes as well as a lot of crystals. I think this is one of the things in my costume collection that I'm the most proud of, which is probably why I find it so frustrating that this gown is really difficult to photograph. The gown is really sparkly in person and it's so hard to capture that on camera. This gown is actually a backup plan. Originally, I wore this gown to the 2019 Costume College Gala. I was working on a totally different project that just wasn't turning out the way that I wanted it to. About a week before Costume College, I abandoned the other project and started this one. I can't believe that this only took me about seven days to finish. I was definitely sewing and ironing on rhinestones until the very last second. Since that first Dior-inspired robe à la Française, I've actually made two others, including this sort of gothy black one. Like most of my costumes, this gown has actually only ever been worn once. I wore this gown to a Halloween ball last year, and I had actually planned on wearing it again to the Venice's Sinking Ball here in Seattle. Unfortunately, that ball ended up getting canceled due to coronavirus, but here's the mask that I was planning on wearing it with. Maybe I'll just hold out for next year. Up next, we have one of my favorite outfits that doesn't happen to be a ball gown. This dress is made from a navy colored velvet and it's worn over a bum roll. I think what I like the most about this project is that it doesn't just feel like a historical costume. It feels like something that I would really wear that actually kind of reflects my taste. Doing this closet tour has also made me realize that I've actually never worn this dress anywhere. Although there obviously aren't any events going on right now, hopefully I'll get a chance sometime soon. The last look was one of my favorites, and this one is definitely one of my least favorite. 
Even though there's nothing particularly wrong with this look, it just doesn't have that classic chemise all around look that I was going for. This is definitely a look that I'm gonna be revisiting at some point in the future. And you can also see why these women definitely had ladies maids because it is really hard to put some of these gowns on by yourself. I made this next dress last summer when I found myself running out of events to sew for. This is another thing in my closet that has never actually been worn anywhere. The reason that I've never worn it anywhere is because it's not historically accurate enough to be worn to an 18th century themed event. And I haven't found a non-historical costuming event that this would make sense for. To be honest, this is the kind of dress that probably never will end up getting worn out of the house. But I really love the Little Red Riding Hood picnic vibes that this dress gives. This next dress is another dress that I made when I had nothing else to work on. And it also happens to be the last 18th century gown in my collection. I actually just finished this gown about a month ago. Every year I get really inspired by spring and I start sewing for the warm weather before we actually have any. One thing I'm definitely guilty of in my historical costuming is never actually making the accessories that I should to go with the gown. This is one of the rare times when I actually went to the extra effort to make a matching hat to go with it. That's the end of my 18th century gowns and I think we'll go in chronological order and I'll show you my Regency stuff next. Regency is actually one of my least favorite eras in costuming so I own a lot fewer gowns for this era than I do for the 18th century. Regency actually tends to be a pretty popular era in costuming. I think Jane Austen novels did a lot to popularize this era in costuming, but I also think it's due especially to how easy these gowns are to make and wear. Navy would actually have been a slightly unusual choice for a gown during this era, which I think is what I like the most about this dress. Even though I don't love the Regency era, I have two more gowns for this period. This next one is made from pink silk and it's probably my favorite one for this era. What I like about this gown is the color and how it billows out behind you when you walk. Although I haven't had a chance to wear this dress more than once, it's one of the few things in my collection that I do think I probably will wear again. Having a go-to dress for this era will help me avoid sewing for an era that I don't even particularly like. I sometimes struggle to resist the urge to make something new for every single event which is how I ended up with this green dress that I wore to a Christmas ball last year. I made this dress in a few hours the day of the event because I felt like I didn't have any Regency dresses that were Christmassy enough. Most Regency dresses are actually white, which is why I chose green because I thought it would help me stand out a little at the ball. Apparently everyone else had the same idea too though because I saw a lot of women wearing green and blue at that ball. The best thing about this dress is definitely the pockets and the green buttons that go up the back. That's the end of my Regency dresses, which takes us to the 1830s. I only own one dress from this era, and it's also a Christmas one. This dress was inspired by a dress that Belle wears in Beauty and the Beast during a snowy scene. I don't normally make Disney-inspired dresses, but this one was an exception because I just love this color palette. Unfortunately, the sleeve supports for this dress are really heavy and you can see that they're dragging the sleeves down instead of holding them up in a nice fluffy shape. If I make another dress for this era, I will definitely be making new sleeve supports as well. The last dress I have before moving into the bustle era, which is my favorite era of costuming, is this 1840s green day dress. This is another project that got abandoned just before being finished. I stopped working on this project because I really didn't have anywhere to wear it. All it needs is a hem and a closure up the back. This video is getting kind of long, so I think I'm going to stop here for now, but it seems like kind of a shame to end the video on an unfinished project. So here's a quick peek at one of my all-time favorite fantasy gowns. I'll talk more about this dress and some of my other non-historical costumes in my next video. Thanks for watching!